1775, the American Revolutionary War began as the American colonies sought to detach from England and its oppressive monarchy. Though many reasons are cited for the revolution, one in particular sticks out as a prime cause. That King George III of England outlawed the interest-free, independent currency the colonies were producing themselves, in turn forcing them to borrow money from the Central Bank of England, immediately creating economic hardship and despair. In the words of Peter Cooper, former Vice President of the New York Board of Currency, after Franklin had explained to the British government as the real cause of prosperity, they immediately passed laws forbidding the payment of taxes in that money. This produced such great inconvenience and misery to the people that it was the principal cause of the revolution. In 1783, America won its independence from England. However, its battle against the central bank concept and the corrupt, power-hungry mentality associated with it had just begun. So what is a central bank? A central bank is an institution that issues and regulates the currency of an entire nation. Based on historical precedent, the typical powers inherent in central banking practice include the control of interest rates and the expansion and contraction of the money supply itself. Now, the central bank does not simply issue money to the government, it loans it to them with interest. Then through the mechanisms of increasing and decreasing the supply of money, the central bank essentially regulates the value of the currency issued. It is critical to understand that the entire structure of this system could only produce one thing in the long run. Debt. It doesn't take a lot of ingenuity to figure this scam out. For every single dollar produced by both the central bank and its regulated commercial banks is loaned at interest. That means every dollar produced is actually the dollar plus a certain percentage of debt based on that dollar. And since the banking system has the monopoly of the production of the currency, and they loan each dollar out with an immediate debt attached to it, where does the money to pay for the debt come from? It can only come from the banks again, which means the banking system has to perpetually increase its money supply to temporarily cover the outstanding debt created, which in turn, since that new money is loaned out at interest as well, creates even more debt. The end result of this system is essentially slavery, for it is technically impossible for the government and thus the public to ever come out of the self-generating debt. By the early 20th century, the U.S. had already implemented and removed a few central banking systems, which were maneuvered into place by ruthless banking interests. At this time, the dominant families in the banking and business world were the Rockefellers, the Morgans, the Warburgs, the Rothschilds. And in the early 1900s, they sought to push, once again, legislation to create another central bank. However, they knew the government and public were very weary of such an institution so they needed to create an incident to affect public opinion. So J.P. Morgan, publicly considered a financial luminary at the time, exploited his mass influence by reportedly creating rumors that prominent banks in New York were insolvent or bankrupt. Morgan knew this would trigger mass hysteria and a systemic crisis, and it did. The public, in fear of losing their deposits, immediately began mass withdrawals. Consequently, the banks were forced to call in their loans, causing the recipients to sell their property, and thus a spiral of bankruptcies, repossessions, and turmoil emerged. Putting the pieces together years later, Congressman Charles Lindbergh wrote, The King bankers put in motion in 1907 a great scheme. They had gambled and speculated on Wall Street until so many watered stocks and bonds had been manufactured. The King bankers knew the condition and informed the favorite of their friends what was to come. There was to be a panic in the fall of 1907, and it would be advertised as the result of our bad banking and currency laws. The panic of 1907 led to a congressional investigation headed by Senator Nelson Aldrich, who had intimate ties to the financial powers and later became part of the Rockefeller family through marriage. 
The commission led by Aldrich recommended a central bank should be implemented so a panic like 1907 could never happen again. This was the spark that the bankers needed to initiate their plan. And in 1910, a secret meeting was held at a J.P. Morgan estate on Jekyll Island off the coast of Georgia. It was there that the central banking bill called the Federal Reserve Act was written. This legislation was written by bankers, not lawmakers. This meeting was so secretive, so concealed from government and public knowledge, that most of the figures who attended disguised their names when en route to the island. And after this bill was constructed, it was then handed over to their political frontman, Senator Nelson Aldrich, to push through Congress. And in 1913, with heavy political sponsorship by the bankers, Woodrow Wilson became president, having already agreed to sign the Federal Reserve Act in exchange for campaign support. And a few days before Christmas, when much of Congress was at home with their families, the Federal Reserve Act was voted in, and Wilson in turn made it law. The night before its passage, Congressman Charles Lindbergh pleaded, This act establishes the most gigantic trust on earth. When the president signs this act, the invisible government by the money power will be legalized. Now, the public was told that the Federal Reserve System was an economic stabilizer, and inflation and economic crises were a thing of the past. Well, as history has shown, nothing was further from the truth. The fact is, the bankers now had a streamlined machine for economic manipulation. It's alive, it's alive, it's alive. For example, from 1914 to 1919, the Fed substantially increased the money supply, resulting in extensive loans to small banks and the public. Then, in 1920, the Fed deliberately contracted credit in an extreme way, thus resulting in banks having to call in large numbers of loans, and, just like 1907, bank runs, bankruptcy, and systemic collapse occurred. Numerous competitive banks outside of the Federal Reserve System collapsed, further consolidating the monopoly of the money trust cartel. Privy to this scheme, Congressman Lindbergh pronounced, under the Federal Reserve Act, panics are scientifically created. The present panic is the first scientifically created one, worked out as we figure a mathematical equation. However, the panic of 1920 was just a warm-up. From 1921 to 1929, the Fed again increased the money supply, resulting once again in extensive loans to the public and banks. There was also a fairly new type of loan in the stock market, the broker call loan. Very simply, this loan allowed an investor to put down only a fraction of the stock's value, with the rest being loaned from the broker. This method was very popular in the roaring 1920s as everyone seemed to be making money in the market. However, there was a catch to this loan. It could be called in at any time and had to be paid within 24 hours. And the typical result was the selling of the stock purchased with that loan. So, a few months before October in 1929, J.D. Rockefeller, Bernard Baruch, and many other insiders quietly exited the market, knowing the bubble created was about to burst. Then, on October 24, 1929, the financiers who furnished the call loans started calling them in in mass. This sparked an instantaneous, massive sell-off in the already inflated market, as sell orders and margin calls were systemically triggered. That then led to mass bank runs, eventually collapsing thousands of banks, enabling the large banks to buy up the now failed banks at a discount. But it didn't stop there. Rather than expanding the money supply in order to recover from this economic collapse, the Fed actually contracted it, fueling one of the largest depressions in American history. Outraged, Congressman Lewis McFadden, then chairman of the House Banking Committee, filed a petition for impeachment against the Federal Reserve Board, stating, Mr. Chairman, we have in this country one of the most corrupt institutions the world has ever known. I refer to the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks. This evil institution has impoverished and ruined the people of the United States and has practically bankrupted our government. It has done this through the defects of the law under which it operates, through the maladministration of that law by the Federal Reserve Board, and through the corrupt practices of the moneyed vultures who control it. Now, having reduced the society to squalor, it was then decided that the gold standard should be removed. In order to do this, they needed to acquire the remaining gold in the system. So, under the pretense of helping to end the depression, came the 1933 gold seizure. 
Under the threat of imprisonment for 10 years, everyone in America was required to turn in all gold bullion to the treasury, essentially robbing the public of what little wealth they had left. And at the end of 1933, the gold standard was abolished. If you look at a dollar bill before 1933, it says it is redeemable in gold. If you look at the dollar bill today, it says it is legal tender, which means it is backed by absolutely nothing. The only thing that gives our money value is the public faith and how much of it is in circulation. Therefore, the power to regulate the money supply is also the power to regulate its value, which is also the power to manipulate and control entire economies. It is important to clearly understand the Federal Reserve is a private corporation. It is about as federal as Federal Express. It makes its own policies and is under little regulation by the US government. It is a private bank that loans all the currency at interest to the government, completely consistent with the central banking model that the country sought to escape from when it declared independence in the American Revolutionary War. Now, going back to 1913, the Federal Reserve Act was not the only bill pushed through Congress for the vested financial interests. They also pushed its partner, the Federal Income Tax. First of all, the Federal Income Tax is completely unconstitutional, as it is a direct, unapportioned tax, and the required number of states needed in order to ratify the amendment to allow the income tax was never legally met, and this has even been cited in modern court cases. Second, at the present day, roughly 25% of the average worker's income is taken from them via this tax. That means you work three months out of the year to fulfill this tax obligation. And where does that money go? According to the Grace Commission report of the 1980s, 100% of what is collected is absorbed solely by interest on the federal debt and by federal government contributions to transfer payments. In other words, all individual income tax revenues are gone before one nickel is spent on the services which taxpayers expect from their government. Today, the money Americans make working three months out of the year goes almost entirely to the interest fees charged for the debt-based fiat currency. The fact is, the federal income tax exists to feed the Federal Reserve, federal government money machine, making sure the interest payments are always there. And third, even with the government claim as to the legality of the income tax, there is still evidently no statute, no law in existence that requires you to pay this tax. I really expected that of course there's a law that you can point to in the law book, the code, that requires you to file a tax return. Of course there is. I was at that point where I couldn't find the statute that clearly made a person liable, uh, at least not me and uh, most people I know. And I had no, no choice in my mind except to, to resign. Based on the research that I did throughout the year 2000 and that I'm still doing, I have not found that law. I've asked uh, Congress, we've asked a lot of people in the IRS, the IRS commissioners, helpers. They can't answer because if they answer, the American people are going to know that this whole thing is a fraud. I haven't uh, filed an income, federal income tax return since I left. I have not filed a tax return since 1999. Now, the control of the economy and the manipulation of society for the vested financial powers is only a part of the game being played. Another level is the business of war. Since the inception of the Federal Reserve in 1913, a number of large and small wars have commenced. The three most pronounced might be World War I, World War II, and Vietnam. World War I. In 1914, European wars broke out centered around England and Germany. The American public wanted nothing to do with the war. In turn, President Woodrow Wilson publicly declared neutrality. However, under the surface, evidence now shows that the financial powers behind the administration were looking for any excuse it could to enter it. It is important to understand that one of the most lucrative things that can happen for the bankers is war. For it forces the country to borrow even more money at interest, not to mention the profits generated through the financing of military production. In the words of two-time Congressional Medal of Honor winner Smedley D. Butler, war is a racket. It always has been. It is possibly the oldest, easily the most profitable, surely the most vicious. 
It is the only one international in scope, and it is the only one in which the profits are reckoned in dollars and the losses in lives. Woodrow Wilson's top advisor and mentor was Colonel Edward House, a man found to have intimate connections with the financial interests of the time. In a conversation with Colonel House, Wilson's advisor, and Sir Edward Grey, the Foreign Secretary of England, regarding America and the war, Grey inquired, what will America do if Germans sink an ocean liner with American passengers on board? House responded, I believe that a flame of indignation would sweep the United States and that by itself would be sufficient to carry us into war. So, on May 7, 1915, a ship called the Lusitania was sent where German military vessels were known to be. And, as likely expected, German U-boats torpedoed the ship, exploding stored munitions, killing 1,200 people. To further understand the obvious anticipation of this setup, the German embassy actually put advertisements in the New York Times telling people that if they boarded the Lusitania, they did so at their own risk, as such a ship sailing from America to England through the war zone would be liable to destruction. In turn, and as anticipated, the sinking of the Lusitania caused a wave of anger among the American population, and America entered the war a short time after. Major General Smedley D. Butler summarizes the monetary reality of World War I. World War II. On December 7, 1941, Japan attacked the American fleet at Pearl Harbor, triggering U.S. entry into that war. President Franklin D. Roosevelt declared the attack was a day that will live in infamy. A day of infamy indeed, but not because of the alleged surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. After 60 years of surfacing information, it is now clear that not only was the attack known well in advance, it was outright wanted and provoked. In a journal entry by Roosevelt's Secretary of War, Henry Stimson, dated November 25, 1941, he documented a conversation he had with Roosevelt. The question was how we should maneuver them into firing the first shot. And in congressional testimony later, he added, It was desirable to make sure the Japanese be the ones to do this, so that there should remain no doubt as to who were the aggressors. In the months leading up to the attack on Pearl Harbor, Roosevelt had done almost everything in his power to anger the Japanese, showing a posture of aggression. He halted all of Japan's imports of American petroleum. He froze all Japanese assets in the United States. He made public loans to nationalist China and supplied military aid to the British, both enemies of Japan in the war, which, by the way, was in complete violation of international war rules. And, with numerous Japanese codes broken in advance, revealing the plan to attack, on December 7, 1941, Japan was allowed to attack Pearl Harbor, killing 2,400 soldiers. Before Pearl Harbor, 83% of the American public wanted nothing to do with the war. After Pearl Harbor, one million men volunteered. It is important to note, Nazi Germany's war effort was largely supported by two organizations, one of which was called IG Farben. IG Farben produced 84% of Germany's explosives. One of the unspoken partners of IG Farben was J.D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil Company in America. In fact, the German Air Force could not operate without a special additive patented by Rockefeller's Standard Oil. The drastic bombing of London by Nazi Germany, for example, was made possible by a $20 million sale of fuel to IG Farben by the Rockefeller's Standard Oil Company. This is just one small point on the topic of how American business funded both sides of World War II. One other treasonous organization worth mentioning is the Union Banking Corporation of New York City. Not only did they finance numerous aspects of Hitler's rise to power, along with actual materials during the war, 
it was also a Nazi money laundering bank, which was eventually exposed for having millions of dollars of Nazi money in its vaults. The Union Banking Corporation of New York was eventually seized for violations of the Trading with the Enemy Act. Guess who the director and vice president of the Union Bank was? Prescott Bush, the father and grandfather of former U.S. Presidents George W. Bush and George H. W. Bush. Vietnam. The United States official escalation and entry into the Vietnam War came after an alleged incident involving two U.S. destroyers being attacked by North Vietnamese PT boats in the Gulf of Tonkin. This is known as the Gulf of Tonkin Incident. This situation was the catalytic pretext for massive troop deployment and full-fledged warfare. One problem, however, the attack on the U.S. destroyers by Vietnamese PT boats never happened. Former Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara stated years later that the Gulf of Tongan incident was a mistake, while classified documents released years later show that it was a farce, manipulated for the purposes of war. And once in the war, it was business as usual. In October 1966, President Lyndon Johnson lifted trade restrictions on the Soviet bloc, knowing full well that the Soviets were providing upwards of 80% of North Vietnam's war supplies. Consequently, the Rockefeller interests financed factories in the Soviet Union, which the Soviets used to manufacture military equipment and send to North Vietnam. However, the funding of both sides in this conflict was only one side of the coin. In 1985, Vietnam's rules of engagement were declassified. This detailed what American troops were and were not allowed to do in the war. It included such absurdities as North Vietnamese anti-aircraft missile systems could not be bombed until they were known to be operational. No enemy could be pursued once they crossed the border of Laos or Cambodia. And most revealing of all, the most critical strategic targets were not allowed to be attacked unless initiated via high military officials. Apart from these illogical limitations, North Vietnam was informed of these restrictions and therefore could base entire strategies around the limitations of the American forces. This is why the war went on for so long. And the bottom line is this, the Vietnam War was never meant to be won, just sustained. This war for profit and resources resulted in 58,000 American deaths and 3 million dead Vietnamese. So, where are we now? September 11th was the jumpstart for a hegemonic agenda, enabling the possibility of constant global warfare. It was a staged war pretext no different than the sinking of the Lusitania, the provoking of Pearl Harbor, and the Gulf of Tonkin lie. In fact, if 9-11 wasn't a planned war pretext, it would be an exception to the rule. It has been used to launch two unprovoked illegal wars, one against Iraq and the other against Afghanistan. However, 9-11 was a pretext for another war as well, the war against you. The Patriot Act, Homeland Security, the Military Tribunals Act, and other legislations are all completely designed to destroy your civil liberties and protect those in power. Currently in the United States, unannounced to most Americans, your home can be searched without a warrant, without you being home. You can in turn be detained indefinitely with no charges revealed to you, no access to a lawyer, and legally tortured all under the suspicion that you might be a terrorist. If you need a painted picture of what is happening, let's recognize how history repeats itself. In February 1933, Hitler staged a false flag attack, burning down his own German parliament building, the Reichstag, blaming it on communist terrorists. Within the next few weeks, he passed the Enabling Act, which completely eradicated the German constitution, destroying people's liberties. He then led a series of preemptive wars, all justified as necessary, to maintaining homeland security. of terrorists and every government that supports them. It's time to wake up. 
The people in power go out of their way to make sure you are perpetually misled and manipulated. The majority's perception of reality, especially in the political arena, is not their own. It is shrewdly imposed upon them without them even knowing it. For example, the public at large now believes the invasions of Iraq and the Middle East, along with the resulting instability, are the consequences of political and military mistakes. What the public fails to see, of course, is that the destabilization of the Middle East is exactly what the Western interests want. This war is to be sustained so the region can be divided up, domination of the oil maintained, continual profits reaped for defense contractors, and most obviously, permanent military bases established to be used as launching pads against other oil-bearing, non-conforming countries, such as Iran. For further implication that the civil war and destabilization is purely intentional, in 2005, two elite British SAS officers were arrested by Iraqi police after being caught driving around in their car, shooting at civilians while dressed up as Arabs. After being arrested and taken to a jail in Basra, the British army immediately demanded release of these men. When the Basra government refused, British tanks came in and physically broke out the men from the Basra prison. If you wish to destroy an area, how do you do it? Well, there are two ways. You can go in there and bomb it and so forth, but that is not very efficient. What you do is you try to get the people in that area to kill each other and to destroy their own territory, their own farms. And that's what's been done in that area. The way in which you destroy an opponent is get him to destroy himself by dividing his ranks against one another. Then you feed both sides. You have agents feeding both sides, inflaming both sides, and they kill each other off. And it's time that some of us woke up to this reality to understand that people who try to maintain empires and create empires do it by manipulating the people they're trying to conquer. You might want to ask yourself why the entire culture is utterly saturated with mass media entertainment from all sides. While the educational system in America continues its stupefying downward slide since the U.S. government decided to take over and subsidize the public school system. What your government pays for, it gets. When we understand that, then we look at government-financed institutions of education and see the kind of students and the kind of education that's being turned out by these government-financed schools logic will tell you that if what is being turned out in those schools was not in accord with what the state and the federal government wanted, then it would change it. The bottom line is that the government is getting what they have ordered. They do not want your children to be educated. They do not want you to think too much that is why our country and our world has become so proliferated with entertainments, mass media, television shows, amusement parks, drugs, alcohol, and every kind of entertainment to keep the human mind entertained so that you don't get in the way of important people by doing too much thinking. You had better wake up and understand that there are people who are guiding your life and you don't even know it. We're in a lot of trouble because you people and 62 million other Americans are listening to me right now because less than 3% of you people read books. Because less than 15% of you read newspapers. Because the only truth you know is what you get over this tube. Right now, there is a whole, an entire generation that never knew anything that didn't come out of this tube. This tube is the gospel, the ultimate revelation. This tube can make or break presidents, popes, prime ministers. This tube is the most awesome goddamn force in the whole godless world. And woe is us if it ever falls in the hands of the wrong people. And when the largest company in the world controls the most awesome goddamn propaganda force in the whole godless world, who knows what shit will be peddled for truth on this network. So you listen to me. Listen to me. Television is not the truth. Television is a goddamn amusement park. 
Television is a circus, a carnival, a traveling troupe of acrobats, storytellers, dancers, singers, jugglers, sideshow freaks, lion tamers, and football players. We're in the boredom killing business. But you people sit there day after day, night after night, all ages, colors, creeds. We're all you know. You're beginning to believe the illusions we're spinning here. You're beginning to think that the tube is reality and that your own lives are unreal. You do whatever the tube tells you. You dress like the tube. You eat like the tube. You raise your children like the tube. You even think like the tube. This is mass madness, you maniacs. In God's name, you people are the real thing. We are the illusion. The last thing the power establishment wants is a conscious, informed public capable of critical thinking. This is why a continually fraudulent zeitgeist is output via religion, the mass media, and the educational system. It is in their interest to keep you in a distracted, naive bubble. And they are doing a damn good job of it. This is Aaron Russo, a filmmaker and former politician. To his left is Nicholas Rockefeller of the Council on Foreign Relations. After maintaining a close friendship with Nicholas, Aaron eventually ended the relationship appalled by what he had learned. Uh, I got a call one day from um, an attorney woman I knew, and she said, would you like to meet one of the Rockefellers? I said, sure, I'd love to. And uh, we became friends. and. Um, he began to divulge a lot of things to me. So he said to me one night, he said that uh, there's going to be an event there. And, and out of that event, you're going to see we're going to go into Afghanistan. So we run pipelines from the Caspian Sea. We're going to go into Iraq to take the oil and establish a base in the Middle East. And we're going to go into Venezuela and, and try and get, and get rid of Chavez. And uh, the first two they've accomplished, Chavez they didn't accomplish. And uh, he said, you're going to see guys going into caves looking for... <laughs> looking for people uh, that they're never going to find. You know, he was laughing about the fact that you have this war on terror. There's no real enemy. He's talking about how by having this war on terror, you can never win it because this, so it's an eternal war. And so you can always keep taking people's liberties away. And I said, how are you going to convince people that this war is real? He said, but the media. The media can convince everybody it's real. I mean... You know, it's just that you keep talking about things, you keep saying it over and over and over again, and eventually people believe it. You know, you created the Federal Reserve in 1913 through lies. You create 9-11, which is another lie. Through 9-11, you, then you're fighting a war on terror, and now all of a sudden you go into Iraq, which was another lie, and now they're going to do Iran. You know, and it's all one thing leading to another, leading to another, leading to another. Now, I would say, that, why, what are you doing this for? What, what, what's the point of this thing? You have all the money in the world you ever want. You have all the power. I said, you know, you're hurting people. It's, it's not a good thing. And he would say, what do you care about the people for? Take care of yourself and you take care of your family. And then I said to him, what's the ultimate, what, what are the ultimate goals here? He said, the ultimate, the, goal, the ultimate goal is to get everybody in this world chipped with the, with the RFID chip and uh, have all money be on those chips and everything on those chips. And if anybody wants to protest what we do or violate what we want, we just turn off the chip. So how far will the sickness of power go? To what lengths will those in control go in order to maintain and preserve their positions? We have a Florida family who are really pioneers in a brave new world. They have volunteered to be the first ever to have microchip identification devices implanted into their body. After 9-11, I was really concerned um, with the security of my family. I wouldn't mind having something planted permanently in my arm that would identify me. George Orwell, in his famed and possibly prophetic work, 1984, stated, Power is not a means, it is an end. The object of persecution is persecution. The object of torture is torture. The object of power is power. Today, symptoms of a surveillance society continue to grow, as irrational fears of invisible enemies, coupled with rising economic instability, spread across the globe. It is under this guise of security that we can foreshadow a world where everyone is tracked, everyone is on camera, and everyone is subordinated. The most incredible aspect of all, such totalitarianism would likely not be forced upon the people, rather the people will demand it. 
for the social manipulation of society through the generation of fear and division has completely inhibited the culture. Religion, patriotism, race, wealth, class, and every other form of arbitrary separatist identification and thus conceit has served to create a controlled population, utterly malleable in the hands of the few. Divide and conquer is the motto, and as long as people continue to see themselves as separate from everything else, they lend themselves to being completely enslaved. However, if the people ever realize the truth of their relationship to nature, and the truth of their personal power to effect change, the entire manufactured zeitgeist that's preyed upon would collapse like a house of cards. <laughs>